Hello, I'm Lou Bloomfield and this is How Things Work. Today's topic, balls add air. If there weren't any air, a ball that wasn't touching anything, that wasn't bouncing or rolling on the ground, would be a falling ball and it would travel in the simple arc of a falling object. Straightforward, simple, maybe even a little boring. The presence of air changes that. The ball has to move through the air, it interacts with the air, it can slow down, it can even turn in certain circumstances uh, as a curveball. To see how that happens though, we have to look at how air and the ball interact. And to do that, we'll use the, all the tools developed in the context of water distribution and uh, water flow and gardening. Uh, as, a, as a brief aside for the experts, basically, in going from a liquid to a gas, we're going from, from water to air, air, air is, things get a little more complicated. Air is, is a compressible fluid. You can pack it more tightly. And that makes air a little more complicated to deal with conceptually in, in the flow than water. Because water is incompressible. You can't pack it more tightly for all practical pur purposes. So airflow around a ball is technically a little more complicated, but we're going to set aside those complications. They're, they're not very important in the flow of air around a ball, so we're going to ignore them. So end, end of aside for the experts. Okay? We're going to watch the air flow around a ball and look at how it pushes on the ball and how the ball pushes on the air. So the first thing we'll do in, in that regard is to deal with airflow that's very slow around the ball. And we're going to, so, so I'll, I'll come back to the sort of context in which we're working. We're going to watch perfect airflow around the ball, and that only occurs when the air flows very slowly around the ball. So again, we'll come back to that. In this situation of perfect airflow around the ball, the air comes along, and it, actually, I should tell you, we're, we're going to adopt the frame of reference where we're moving with the ball. So the ball appears motionless to us, and the air is rushing by it. So uh, normally when you are at some park watching a, a game that involves a ball moving around, the ball is moving through essentially stationary air. Now, let's not do that. Let's actually be the ball and watch the air come past us. It just makes life simpler for, for the story and for understanding the flow. So we're going to have air rushing along, coming in here. Uh, I'm going to have it come along from your right, heading toward the left, just because it. I make a choice. So as the air flows along to, to encounter the front of the ball, well, it can't go through the ball. The ball won't allow that. So the ball pushes the air away to make the airflow spread. So the, the air bends away from the ball, both toward you at the, at the, at the front, uh, upward at the top, downward at the bottom, and toward me at the back. So the air is spreading out. That involves a push outward by the ball's front surface. But the ball can only push on the very the layer of air right at, it, right at the, the surface, and that layer in turn has to push on the other layers. So there is an outward push on all these layers of air flowing toward the front of the ball, and the air is accelerating away from the ball. To have that happen, the air has to have a pressure gradient across it. That's, that's what pushes on air. Um, air. It allows air to push on air. It has variations in pressure. Gravity is, is irrelevant for this story. It's, it's a trivial issue uh, for this story. We're going to set aside gravity. We're going to set aside the buoyant force on the ball. Yes, it's experiencing a slight upward lift due to its displacement of air. All gone. Okay? The air comes in. It's pushed away from the ball by a pressure gradient. And the pressure gradient develops such that it pushes away from the ball. Well, that means that the pressure far from the ball has to be lower than pressure right near the front of the ball. So that there's a push away. Well, the pressure far from the ball out here is just ordinary atmospheric pressure. 
the pressure near the ball has to be higher than that in order to push the airflow away. So the air pressure at the front of the ball is above atmospheric pressure. You can think of the air as, as kind of colliding with that front surface and transferring momentum to that front surface and therefore uh, developing a larger pressure. All right. That's a real effect. The, front, the pressure at the front of the ball where the air first hits it is above atmospheric pressure. All right, let's continue to watch the flow. Well, the air now that's spreading out away, has been away from the surface of the ball, now can't just keep going. It'll leave an empty spot behind it. So it has to bend again toward the ball surface to follow the, the, the curvature for the, around. The layer going over the ball, which was heading up this way, ah, it's got to bend this way to, to, to stay with the ball. So it has to bend toward the surface around this sort of equator of the ball, the, the, the midpoint of the ball. And for the air to bend toward the surface, which is to say accelerate toward the surface, it has to be pushed toward the surface by a pressure gradient. That The pressure has to be lower near the surface than it is far from the surface, so that there's a net push toward the surface. Since the air out here is atmospheric pressure, the air very close to the surface of the ball has to be below atmospheric pressure. And it is. The pressure, the pressure around the, the, this middle portion of the ball is less than atmospheric. So, so far we've gone from high pressure at the front of the ball, smoothly to low pressure around this mid girth of the ball. What about at the back? Well, the air is now bent toward the, toward the ball surface and it would all crash together at the back if, if it kept on going. So it has to bend. Again, it has to bend away from the ball. So it was heading toward the back of the ball and it curves away and leaves. And that curve away from the back of the ball requires yet another pressure gradient. You have to have higher pressure near the surface of the ball than far from the surface of the ball. So the air flow is pushed away from the ball to bend away and leave, head off into the distance. So there's high pressure. Again, this is atmospheric pressure out here. That's got to be higher than atmospheric pressure at the back of the ball. So you have this wonderfully symmetric arrangement in the case of perfect flow around the ball, where you have high pressure where the, where the air first encounters the ball. You have low pressure, below atmospheric, in the region around the, the, the girth, this middle point of the ball. And then you have high pressure again at the back. And in principle, it's perfectly symmetric. The pressure here is the same as the pressure here. And the pressure at the top of the ball is the same as the pressure at the bottom of the ball. Every point you find, this point here is matched by a point over here. There is no overall pressure force on the ball. It's, it's all, the pressures are vary over the surface of the ball, but they cancel perfectly because for every high or low pressure you have here, you have the same high or low pressure there on the, on the opposite side. It all cancels to nothing. No pressure force at all. And that is the case in perfect flow, laminar flow around a ball. There's no pressure imbalance across it. And that means in principle the ball, it's, it's looking like the ball should move perfectly through the air. The air should just go around it, reconvene in the, at the back side, completely ignore the ball, and the ball should go through without experiencing any force due to the air. That is not the case. The air does push on the ball, but not by way of pressure-related forces. Instead, it pushes on the ball by way of skin surface interactions involving viscosity. Air, after all, is a fluid, a real fluid, and it has a viscosity. It's a tiny little viscosity, but it's there nonetheless. And it does push, interact with the ball surface. In principle, the air flow around, right at the surface is motionless, and the layers of air getting farther and farther from the surface rub against each other by way of viscous uh, forces. And the result is that the ball experiences a very small force due to viscosity, and that force is directed in the direction of the airflow. So as the air is flowing from your right to your left, 
It rubs on the ball by way of viscosity and it pushes the ball downwind in the direction of the airflow. Forces that act along the direction of airflow and that, are, that, are, that, are, that appear because of airflow or fluid flow are known as drag forces. The common name is, is like air resistance. The technical, the physicist or engineer's name is drag forces, air drag. And the air, in effect, drags or tries to drag the ball with it. So that's the origin of, of drag forces. Any force that is directed in the direction of the airflow is a, is a drag force. There's more than one. Uh, a force that's at right angles to the airflow, and there are such things, oddly enough, those are called lift forces. The, lift for, the na name lift force is, is not ideal because it suggests an upward aspect of the force. It, it's not necessarily upward. A lift force is at, at right angles to the airflow. Uh, whether it's upward, toward you, toward me, downward, those are all lift forces. Drag forces, downwind. In this case, the air is flowing to your left, the drag force is to the left. Okay? So this is a drag force. Because it's associated with vis viscosity and the rubbing of air around this ball as the air makes perfect laminar flow, it's called viscous drag. So the ball experiences viscous drag. Okay, having said that, let me put this into context. For this ball to have perfect laminar flow around it, it has to be in a situation where viscosity and the ordering effects of viscosity dominate over the disordering effects of inertia. And that will only occur if the air is moving exquisitely slowly past the ball. Way too slowly to be, to be realistic. Uh, the Reynolds number describing the flow around this ball, that is the ratio of inertial effects divided by viscous effects, that Reynolds number is way too high, way above 2,000. When the ball is moving through the air or the air is moving past the ball at a very slow pace, you know, a snail's pace, the air goes turbulent way too easily when it tries to go around something as big as this ball. The obstacle is too big. So, does this situation ever appear? The answer is sure, it does. Don't, don't look for it in objects this big though. Look for it in objects the size of a dust particle. Those teeny tiny particles can interact with the air uh, with perfect flow around them. They can have perfect laminar flow around them. They move very slowly through the air. They develop nice laminar flow around them and they experience only viscous drag. And viscous drag is enough. The force of viscous drag can be quite strong for a tiny little particle that has so much of its substance on the surface. It's, it, it has almost no inside, a tiny particle does. So it has very little weight, which depends on, on its insides, and a lot of surface. So it interacts with the air strongly, for, relatively speaking, and viscous drag is very influential for tiny particles. It's what keeps dust particles from dropping to the ground. You know, most dust is made of ordinary substances, wood, rock, uh, liquids. You know, there are things that, if they were big, they're heavy and dense and they fall to the ground easily. They're not buoyant like a balloon. They would just plop. But if you grind them up teeny tiny, they experience enough viscous drag that their descent through the air is very, very, very slow. And that's what keeps dust aloft. The air is rushing up, the dust gets lifted with the air, and off it goes. So viscous drag is, is influential for tiny particles that experience laminar flow because they're so small, and they have small Reynolds numbers as a result. And viscosity is able to keep the flow laminar. So okay, well back to an, ordinar an ordinary ball, the balls that you use in, in everyday games. Those balls are big. They essentially never uh, have laminar flow around them. They always have turbulence somewhere. So in that case, what happens? Well, and where does the turbulence, why does it occur? Uh, apart from it just being more likely in, in, with high Reynolds numbers. In a real ball moving through the air at a re reasonable speed, in the case of this, a baseball, let's suppose the baseball is moving 
through the air at, at 50 miles an hour, 80 kilometers per hour. And uh, let's move with the ball so the air is coming at us at, at this speed, 50, 50 miles per hour, 80 kilometers per hour. When it encounters the front surface, it bends away from the surface just as before. Same story. It bends away, and that requires a high pressure at the front of the ball to push the air away. As the air starts to go around the sides, it bends toward the sides, and that requires a low pressure around the girth of the ball. And as the air continues toward the back, it starts to have trouble. And the Reynolds number is, is, is high, and turbulence is the likely outcome, but where does the turbulence originate from? Well, as that air is flowing around the back of the ball, it has a problem. If it could flow without rubbing at all on that ball, it would, it would manage to get to the back of the ball, develop high pressure at the back, and leave, and you get laminar flow, even though it should be turbulent. But that doesn't happen. The air very close to the ball is aware of the ball's surface. It, it, it is interacting with the ball's surface by way of viscosity. The, the innermost layers of air rub significantly on that, that, sur that stationary surface of the ball and they influence the layers near them. And basically they suck the energy, the kinetic energy, out of that airflow, the layers that are very close to the surface, the layers that are aware of the surface. And there's a name for those layers. They're called the boundary layer. I mean, as a group, they're, they're known as the boundary layer. The portion of the flow that really knows the surface is there and is interacting with it by way of viscous forces. The air, the air out here, oblivious to the surface. The air right in there, a few millimeters above the surface, it knows that the surface is there because it's stuff, stuff nearby is rubbing. Okay? So that air loses energy, loses kinetic energy. And it needs that kinetic energy because it is heading from low pressure near the, uh, near the, the middle of the ball to high pressure at the back of the ball. Remember the pressure in perfect flow, you got high pressure, low pressure, high pressure. This air is going from low pressure to high pressure, which seems like an impossible job. Flows accelerate, air, air accelerates toward low pressure. Well, it's true, air accelerates to low pressure, but if it's already moving towards high pressure, it can keep going, it just gets slower. And so the air is trying to go from low pressure to high pressure, barreling ahead, using its momentum to, to, to make the trip despite being pushed backwards, but with the added uh, difficulty of rubbing on the surface, this air very close to the surface just runs out of steam. It loses all its momentum and it comes to a stop. And that's a disaster for steady state flow. You can't have part of the flow stop in steady state flow because it piles up there. So you lose steady state flow at the back. That air, air layer, the boundary layer coming to a stop ruins steady state flow and creates a pocket behind the, a pocket of, of semi-motionless semi air behind the ball that peels off the rest of the flow. So what develops behind the ball is a big chunk of, of swirling air back here, turbulent air, surrounded by continuing smooth flow on, on the periphery. So there's a big, it's, it's actually cylindrically shaped because of the symmetry of the ball around, around this rotation axis. It's a, it, there's a cylinder of swirling mess behind the ball. And a common name for that is a, is a wake, like the wake behind a boat. And this is an air wake. And the air in this wake is based, is, is, from, from our perspective, is mostly stopped. It's not moving very fast anymore. So the air has taken, the, the, the ball has taken air that was moving by it at, if you remember my story, 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour, and has basically sucked all the, 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 moment, the leftward momentum out of that air. So the air is sort of dawdling along behind it. For that to happen, the ball has had to receive the momentum. The ball is pushed fiercely to your left, downstream uh, uh, and with the flow. So it's experiencing a drag force. And this drag force is pressure related. It's not the viscous drag. This is drag is there as well, but this is an extra drag. It's called pressure drag. And it comes about because there's the high pressure at the front, that's still occurring, remember? The low pressure on the sides, still occurring to an extent. 
The high pressure in the back, gone. This, this air pocket back there is basically an atmospheric pressure. So the high pressure at the front of the ball is not balanced by a high pressure at the back of the ball. Instead, it wins. The high pressure at the front of the ball pushes the ball downstream. And that's called pressure drag because of the, it's associated with the unbalanced pressures now on the ball. And it's, it's strong, it's dominant. It's the, it's the drag of, of virtually all ball sports. It's the key drag. Pressure drag. And it's related to the, to the formation of this turbulent wake or turbulent air pocket behind the ball. And incidentally, that turbulent wake is about as big around as the ball it is. It's, it's, it's good size. And so you're dragging a big pocket of air with you, uh, you the ball. Is there any hope? That, that's very influential. It slows a ball down a lot. As a ball tries to move through, the, through air at 50 miles an hour, baseball, um, it, it loses a lot of its forward momentum fighting to get through the air. Big air resistance in common language. It turns out that if the ball goes fast enough through the air, or the air goes fast enough past the ball, and for a baseball, it's somewhere in the 100 mile per hour or 160 kilometer per hour range. Something surprising happens. Remember that, that boundary layer, that layer of air that, that runs out of, out of forward momentum trying to get to the back of the ball? Once the airflow is fast enough, that, that boundary layer itself begins to swirl. It becomes turbulent. And that might seem like an even worse disaster, but oddly enough, it becomes a it's a it's it's a it's a, it's a feature, not a bug. It's a good thing. That tumbling layer of air uh, helps that boundary layer make it farther toward the back of the ball. Because instead of the innermost layer fighting its way the whole way against the worst of the viscous forces, it's replaced periodically by air from farther away from the ball. It's still fresh. It still has extra energy. So it's kind of a tag team effect where the air, is, as it tumbles in that boundary layer, uh, different portions of air get to contribute their forward momentum. And they, 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 they help each other struggle to the back of the ball. And you still get turbulence behind the ball. But the turbulent wake that forms, that air pocket, is smaller in diameter when this, is, when this occurs. So at very fast, um, movements. So ball, when a ball moves fa very fast through the air, or the air moves very fast past the ball, you get a smaller wake, and that reduces the strength of the, the, of the pressure drag. So pressure drag becomes, is very significant for, uh, for a ball moving slowly. Once the ball moves fast enough through the air, there is a little respite. It gets a little bit less pressure drag than it would otherwise have had by shrinking shrinking that uh, air pocket, getting the, the, the turbulent boundary layer. And one sport that develops that turbulent boundary layer, it, it kind of cheats. It, it forces the turbulent boundary layer to occur to allow the, the airflow to be better. It's a golf ball. It's nice to have almost everything within it, hands reach. So a golf ball has dimples. Why the dimples? The dimples serve a simple purpose. They trip the boundary layer. They, they force it to tumble. As the, as the boundary layer around the golf ball encounters those dimples, ah, it starts to swirl. They force it to swirl. And the result is that the airflow around the back of the ball is, is helped. It becomes turbulent, of course, because it, it's going too fast. However, the turbulent weight that it forms is smaller than it would if the ball were smooth. And this was actually discovered accidentally or, or, or empirically in, in, in the mid-1800s, people initially, when they first started making synthetic balls, you know, out of, basically out of, out of plastics uh, or rubbers, uh, they, they made them smooth initially, and they didn't fly very well. And people discovered that as they damaged the ball, as they nicked it and chopped it up uh, with play, it flew better. It, made it, it would travel farther. And eventually they realized, oh, let, let's pre-damage let's pre the surface, and they started putting various structures on the surface during the production process, and eventually they ended up with dimples. So that's that, the, the, the presence of those dimples allows the ball to travel dramatically farther than it would without the dimples. Okay, so that's the story of airflow around a ball, a, a simple, simple ball just sitting there having the air go by it, 
at exquisitely low speed, you get only viscous drag because you get perfect airflow, laminar. At any normal speed, you get pressure drag as well because you have a turbulent air pocket that forms behind, turbulent wake that forms behind the ball. And the size of that turbulent wake varies. Uh, at low speed, it's pretty much the whole size of the ball. At, at very high speed, it can shrink because of this interesting boundary layer turbulent uh, tumbling effect. What, however, if the ball is not just sitting there, but is instead spinning? If the ball is spinning, the interactions between the ball's surface and the nearby air change the shape of the airflow that, that forms around it in steady state, uh, even, even with or without turbulence. And the ball surface distorts the air, the, the pattern of pressure that develops around the ball. And let me let me spin the let me have the air flow at the ball while the top surface. See, I, I'll, I'll make the top surface come come uh, rotate away. It's, if you throw a ball into the air, you pull back on the top surface. So a normal fastball is thrown with the top surface spinning away from uh, away from from the catcher and therefore in the direction of the airflow. The air flowing over the ball in this case is flowing with the surface and is assisted and flows farther around the back of the ball than it otherwise would before it breaks away air pocket and all that stuff. And even, even in laminar flow it follows for, uh, farther. So it ends up leaving with a somewhat downward heading. And the airflow going under the ball is fighting against the surface, which is coming at it, and that airflow breaks off early as a result. And it ends up also heading downward. So a ball that is thrown by a, it, with a conventional pitching style where you, the top two fingers pull back on the ball as it, as it leaves the, the pitcher's hand, that ball, as it flies towards home plate, is deflecting the airstream from horizontal to somewhat downward. And if you push the air down, it's going to push you up. So this ball experiences an upward force due to the deflection of the airstream. Now that, since it's an upward force as a consequence of a horizontal airflow, it's a lift force. It happens to be vertically upward, but it doesn't have to be. You can throw the ball differently and you'll get a different lift force, a different direction. But this one is upward. And you can also view this, this the deflection should, should give away the fact that the air deflection, that the force is upward, because if you push the air downward, it's, it's got to push upward. The other thing you can look at is, is the air pressure. The, the air follows that curve over the top of the ball extra long when it's spinning as, I've, as I'm doing. And that's low pressure up here because the air is bending toward the ball. You get a big low pressure region on the top of the ball. And you get a very small low pressure, in fact, maybe not even much low pressure at all on the bottom of the ball. So there's low pressure on top, high pressure below, that pushes the ball upward by way of pressure, uh, pressure imbalance. So this ball, thrown this way, doesn't follow the path of a falling ball properly. It's got an additional force due to, due to airflow, an aerodynamic force. And that force is upward. And it sustains the travel of the ball more than normal. The ball doesn't descend the way it, way it normally would. Uh, if you throw the ball without that spin, so that it's just going more or less uh, ro rotationless, and we'll get to the rotationless in a minute, the ball will, will follow the path of a truly falling ball, and apart from slowing down the air resistance, and it will descend faster. So it's considered sort of a sinking pitch. It, it goes downward faster than expected, because most balls are thrown a lot of, a lot of top a lot of this backspin, and they, they, they hover more. Uh, the extreme case is a golf ball. Golf balls are usually are hit uh, with a, with a the, the club hits them and causes a tremendous amount of, of backspin. The top comes back towards the person who hit the ball. And those balls deflect the air downward strongly, and the result is the, the golf ball flies. Yeah, you, you, don't, if you, you don't have to hit it at a very high angle for it to travel far. If you hit it at a low angle with that, a lot of the back, that backspin, that upward force created by, by, the, by deflecting the air or developing this low pressure on top of the ball supports the ball and it, and it will just cruise along like an airplane for a very long distance. Okay, so that's, 
That's what happens if you throw the ball so that it, it has backspin. You're pulling the back of the ball. If you, if, you, if you spin the ball on some other axis, you can develop this aerodynamic force to cause the ball to curve. And so that's the origin of curve balls and, and sliders and, and screw balls. There are a bunch of different ways of throwing a ball, which I'm not expert in at all. Uh, if you spin the ball in certain directions, it will deflect the airstream and develop high pressures and low pressures that are unequal uh, on, on two sides of the ball, and the ball will curve in flight. Not a lot, usually, in the, in the game of baseball, but, but enough that it's uh, important in the, in the process of trying to hit the ball. If the ball is not coming straight like, a, like an object, like a falling ball, it gets a little harder to hit and predict where it's going to be. And one other uh, interesting case of this whole story is suppose you throw a ball without any spin at all, which is tricky to do. It's called a knuckle ball, and the poor man's or cheater man's uh, or woman's uh, version of it is a spit ball. You know, put, put on grease on your hands or, or spit. So the ball leaves your hands without spin. If it's essentially not spinning, then the airflow around it because begins to depend exquisitely on features on the surface, like the stitches or nicks on the ball, things that are imperfect about that ball. And the airflow, as it goes over, you know, the, the, the stitches might, might trip the boundary layer and change the, the, the local shape of the, of the wake that forms. Um, and they do it in an erratic manner, because if the ball is just kind of dithering around a little bit as it flies, say, to home plate, the shape of the wake is, is fluctuating in shape and, 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 and direction. And the ball will consequently accelerate in unpredictable ways to the right, left, up, and down. It gets weird, unpredictable lift forces and is therefore difficult to hit. So spinless or nearly spinless balls follow interesting and unpredictable paths on their, on their flight. And that's true not only in baseball, but in, in volleyball, for example, a spinless ball will dither around. I think it's called a floater. Uh, again, hard to, hard to pr prepare for. So that's the story of balls and air. They, they experience various types of drag forces. The two that are, that are crucial here are viscous drag, which is always present, and pressure drag that's present whenever you get that turbulent weight behind. Um, and they can also experience lift forces if there's something not symmetric about the, how the ball moves through the air. If it's spinning, for example, or if it's got features on it that it presents to the airflow that are not symmetric around the ball and it gets pushed to the side with lift forces. And that then is the story of balls and air.